Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 17th chapter. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you, for the words that you gave me I have given to them. And they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. The word of the Lord. Please be seated. Grace and peace be unto you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, a parade is a procession of people. It's a a group moving along in an orderly or ceremonial way. Uh, There's a sense that as you experience a parade that things are moving forward. It's not the sense of things are moving backward. There's a continual stream of progress. Uh, We all experience all sorts of parades in this life, and parades have a variety of purposes. If you think about it, some of the ones my kids experience right now are homecoming parades at their high schools with their floats, their class floats, the king and queen They celebrate school pride. They're, in a sense, to renew the enthusiasm for your school and your class. There's uh, victory parades for sports teams. Tuesday, you can guarantee there's going to be a parade either in Kentucky or Kansas. There will be a victor parade in one and probably just a uh, not quite as celebratory if you lose. Parades occur at special times of year to celebrate culture or some ethnic traditions Think about parades at Thanksgiving, Chinese New Year, New Year's Day. Some of you just were a part of St. Patrick's Day or Halloween parades. There's parades at theme parks where, uh, you know, you, you sit in one place and you see a stream of characters go by that is really to draw you into the story. But the reality is I think it's to sell you all the gadgets and gizmos from every street vendor. There are parades, though, to raise awareness protest march to raise awareness of certain issues. There's uh, walks to, uh, to raise money for or, or in honor of people. You think about it, all, probably almost all of us know someone who will be a part of the breast cancer walk in the coming weeks. They're raising awareness, doing it in honor of someone, and everybody will be decked out in pink. You'll see them all over the area. There are parades to mark profound changes in life. Think about the parades that are a part of of a wedding. People dressed in their fanciest clothes to mark a change in a couple's life, to gather around them to celebrate. Parades are full of fanfare, often there are music, often there's a lot of noise. Those are the hallmark moments of life where pictures are taken because they're moments to remember. A couple years ago, there were a few of us at Good Shepherd reading a book called The Last Week. And a parade that they talked about in that book would have occurred uh, every Jewish festival. But it's not, that parade is not really told about in the Gospels, but it certainly occurred every time there was a festival in Jerusalem. It was the parade of Pontius Pilate, the Roman leader in Israel during the first century. The uh, Israel in the first century, you have to remember, Rome was the occupying force. They were in charge of the land. The Israelites were not. The Romans liked it that way. They planned to keep it that way. So Pilate had this magnificent palace. I mean, it, 
it was in a gorgeous area. It's called Caesarea Maritima. It's about 60 to 70 miles away from Jerusalem. It's on, right on the coast of the Mediterranean. It is this beautiful seaport that was created there. Literally moved tons of turf to create this massive port. There was a palace there for Pilate that uh, was sort of right out into the sea. There was a, a, t a theater for about seven or 8,000 people. There was a Circus Maximus for uh, horse races and chariot races. There was an aqueduct bringing water from the north. There was a temple to the Roman gods. It really was a mini, mini Rome. Magnificent place. But several times of the year, Pilate had to leave this magnificent city to head to Jerusalem for the pilgrimage festivals when the, there would just be a massive influx of people into Jerusalem. He had to go to maintain order. And Pilate would leave that place. He would come to Jerusalem, but in no way would he have come quietly. In no way would it have been a humble entry into Jerusalem. The parade of Pilate would have been to show, all along the way, to show who's the boss and who is not. And we know that Rome was the boss and Israel was not. He would have come in from the northwest. Caesarea Maritima would have been northwest of Jerusalem. He would have come with a large group of soldiers. You can imagine them marching in tandem. You can even imagine them with flags and archers and trumpeters, horses and chariots. It would have been a steady stream, a steady witness of power and might. And Pilate would have loved that. He would have wanted it that way. Every time he came into town, the parade was meant to show who's in charge. And in, in a sense, the message was, don't mess with us. Don't counter us. On the other side, we read about a different procession that uh, we read about in Gospel of Mark. It's on the eastern side of the city. It's a totally different parade altogether. As a child, I always picture Jesus' entry into Jerusalem as this massive ticker tape event that just drew in thousands upon thousands. People swept into the moment. And uh, Mark sort of tells it differently. Mark tells it in a much more quiet, simple way. In a sense, he says Jesus is the uh, organizer of the parade. He intentionally sets things in motion. It's, he says to his followers, go into town, get this colt. And in a sense, he gives them the password, if you will. Gives them a password and says, if they ask what's going on, just tell them what I have, have told you, and it'll happen. So they go into town. He, he, they give him the password. He secures the colt. They bring the colt to Jesus, and uh, he sits on it. One of the things we have to remember, if you read the entire Gospel of Mark, he, Jesus had been stirring up the people in Galilee. They'd been excited by his teaching, by his miracles, by his witness, and at times they had wanted to make him king, and every single time, guess what Jesus said? He told him every single time to be quiet. Don't tell anyone. Stay silent. Stay behind the scenes. But here on the other side of the city, all of a sudden, Jesus now seems willing, seems willing to declare himself the king. In, in the book of Zechariah, near the end of the Old Testament, uh, Zechariah says the king would come into Jerusalem humble, riding on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. And in the very next verse, he describes the ways of that king. He says that king will cut off the chariots. He will banish war. There'll be no more chariots, no more war horses, no more bows and arrows, no more who's the boss type mentality. Zechariah says that that, that king, when he arrives, will bring the day of peace to all the nations. So Jesus secures that colt, sits on that, and in a sense announces, I am this humble king who has been prophesied long ago. It is so radically different on the eastern side as it is, was on the western side with Pilate's parade. The only ones really who are swept into Jesus' parade seem to be the ones who were walking with him all along. They, the ones who came with Jesus, not a massive crowd that I envisioned as a kid. Jesus' traveling companions seem to be the ones who gather the, uh, the branches and throw them down in this path. And in a sense, what that, to me, that's an act that says, I honor this path of humble service. And in a sense, by throwing it down, you're saying, I endorse this path, this type of kingship, this way of living. 
Some, in a sense, it seemed to give the shirt off their back, throw it down in his path, endorsing it even further. To give the shirt off your back, when we use that phrase, we're saying we're willing to give everything. We're willing to go the extra mile to help advance Jesus' message and his mission. It's, it's a way of saying we're not holding back. We're giving it all. Today, the disciples got it right. In the days to come, they'll get it wrong. They'll mess up. They'll flee. The path that they endorse today is not necessarily the one they're going to endorse later in the week. It's as if they take away the cloaks, take away the branches and saying, this is too tough. You go at it alone, Jesus. And I think as we begin Holy Week, we have to say to ourselves, how often by the way we live our life, do we take away our endorsement of Jesus' path of humble service? By the way we live our life, How often do we take away that endorsement? The world we live in just is not opposed to Christianity. I think the world we live in yearns to see Christ followers simply walk the walk every day of their life. They yearn to see us give the shirt shirt off our back to serve other people. They yearn to see us be a profound witness of generosity and selflessness. They yearn for us to speak about peace, but not just talk about it, but to model it every day of our life. The world around us yearns for us to live more like Jesus, to be more humble and to be more compassionate, not just on Sunday, but every day of the week, every day of the year. Following the way of that humble king will indeed change the world if we simply jump on board and trust that Jesus will lead us in the right path. Today, as I said with the kids, we're on board. We're excited. We're ready to say hip, hip, hooray. But will we do that tomorrow and the day after? Amen.